Good afternoon, everyone. As you might already know, Wi-Fi devices use a protocol called WPA2 to secure the communications over the air. About four months back, it feels like a long time back, but about four months back, a few researchers from Europe published a paper pointing out some vulnerabilities with WPA2. Even the mainstream media picked up on this and wrote lots of articles about crack. Some of them were accurate, some of them were not so accurate. I'll take the next 30 minutes or so to talk about, to give you a brief overview of what this crack is all about. Here's the outline of my talk. I'll first talk by, start by introducing what I call as two cardinal rules of encryption. Once we understand these rules, we'll be able to appreciate the loopholes that this crack attack exploits. And then I will talk about what countermeasures need to be taken to address these loopholes. And I'll also spend some time talking about the real exposure of this attack. And I'll finally conclude by talking about how the industry and the Wi-Fi Alliance is reacting to this. Here is my first rule of encryption. The rule is you should never ever accept an old packet again. I'll talk about this, I'll explain this with an example. Let's say I have a temperature sensor at my home. And when the temperature drops, the temperature sensor sends a message to the access point. The access point picks up the message and then passes it to some logic that's sitting behind the access point. Upon receiving that, the logic cranks up the heat. Obviously, this has to be encrypted, otherwise some malicious device can come and send this temperature as low message and uh, you know, my home will get, you know, the, the room, heat in my home will keep going up. Encryption, just encryption is not sufficient. Let's say a malicious device comes into my home and then records this temperature as low message that's coming out of my sensor and then replays that message and let's say it keeps on replaying it again and again. Then the logic will keep picking up this message and then keep cranking up the heat. So to prevent this replay attack, what the encryption standards typically do is introduce this concept of packet number. And I, let's say I received the last packet, I received I had a packet number of 10. I know that the next packet is going to have a number 11 or higher. So if I see 10 or lower, I'm going to drop that packet. Right. So this prevents the replay attack because if I recorded the message, it still is going to have that same old packet number. And the logic recognizes that it's a replayed packet and drops. Okay. But let's say somehow I trick the AP into resetting the packet number. Then somebody can replay that old packet again and heat up my house. Okay. So keep that in mind because this is what crack is going to do. It will somehow trick the devices into resetting the packet number. The second rule is we should never transmit two different packets with the same encryption key. This again I'll exam explain with a simple example. Let's say we play a game and I ask you to think of a number and you don't tell me the number but you add something else to it and then tell me the number. So when I hear this x plus z, x is the number that you thought of, z is that arbitrary number that you added to it. If you tell me x plus z, there's no way I can guess x because I don't know what the z is. And I don't know what x is either. And again, I ask you to do the same. You thought of y, you added z to it, and you told me y plus z. I don't know either x or y. But let's say the tenth number that I know that the tenth number that you're always going to think of is 42. Then once I have that known number, then I can work backwards and you know, figure out all your numbers because once I have this uh, known packet or the known number, then with the easy math, I can figure out everything. Okay. This is applicable to any Wi-Fi packet or any packet for that matter, any encrypted packet for that matter. You know, if the information is getting encrypted with the same key, you know, somehow I know that one of the packets is some known ARP packet or DNS packet or something, and I know some of the fields there, then I can work backwards and start figuring out the other unknown packets. Okay. 
So the basic rule is the transmitter needs to keep on changing the encryption key. One way, or uh, the typical way this is accomplished is there is an unknown key, and then you manipulate that unknown key with the packet number because you know every packet is going with a new number, and every time this manipulated uh, you know, unknown scrambler key plus this packet number is a new number, and then it keeps on changing. Both the transmitter and receiver know how this is all going to work. So that way, I am encrypting different packets differently. Okay. Here again, the key thing that to notice is the whole logic relies on different packets having diff packet, different packet numbers. And again, if I somehow manage to trick the device into resetting its packet number, then I manage to make the device transmit two different packets with the same packet number, it's the same encryption key. And then somehow I can work backwards and figure out what is going on over the air. Okay. So like I said, it's all about getting the, tricking the devices into resetting the packet number. Okay. All right, so let's talk about how we can trick a client into resetting its packet number. Okay. For this, we need to understand what I call as a e-pole or a four-way handshake. Now, when your phone connects to the Wi-Fi network here, one of the steps it goes through is this four-way handshake. Okay. This is the process through which both sides agree upon how the encryption is going to be done. The way it works is the access point sends something called a message one. The station or your phone responds with a message two. And then in response to message two, the access point sends a message three. At this point, what your phone does is it goes and installs the key. This is the key it's going to use for all its encryption. Okay. This typically happens at the start of a session. So an obvious thing to do is at that point go and reset your packet number. Okay. And then the client responds with the message four. This is a thing that always happens. Okay. What these crack guys did is, okay, the access point sends a M3 or the message three. I know that at this point, the packet number is going to be reset. The key gets installed, packet number is going to be reset. The client transmits M4 back. Okay. Somehow, a malicious device in the middle manages to suppress this M4. Right? This can be done with a man in the middle attack. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that aspect of it, but you know, for this talk, let's assume that somehow a malicious device manages to suppress this M4. What the AP is going to do is, it did not receive M4, so it assumes that the client probably did not, uh, it assumes that the client did not receive M3, and it's going to transmit M3 again. At that point, the logic, what the, the software on the client side, what it's going to do is it receives M3 and resets the packet number again. It just resetted the packet number. And then it, it, the way it's going to work is M3 comes, and then the client thinks that I'm all set with my encryption key. I'm going to start transmitting my data packets. The data packets are going to the AP. The man in the middle is picking up those data packets. And also, in parallel, what it did is it suppressed the M4. So because M4 got suppressed, AP is going to send this M4 again. Then the client is going to reset its packet number and then continue transmitting packets. What ended up happening is my initial packets went with this set of encryption keys based on the packet number. M3 got retransmitted, the packet number got re reset, and the subsequent packets are again getting transmitted with the same encryption key. This is violating my rule number two. So now the man in the middle can somehow look at these two packets, and if one of the packets happens to be known, it can figure out what the other packet is. Okay. So the workaround is very simple. The patch that probably most of you picked up is doing a very simple thing. You know, it, this is a patch that needs to go into your phones and every station device. The simple, the right thing to do is if M3, you know, if I know that I just received an M3 and for the same session, without receiving M1, M2, I'm receiving M3 again, don't reset the packet number. You know, you don't even reinstall the key, okay? 
So that's why this attack is called key reinstallation attack. Basically, you know, we are tricking the client into reinstalling the key, and that's what caused this whole vulnerability. Okay? All that the patch does is, on the client side patch, all it does is, you know, it makes sure that if M3 is re-received, it doesn't reset the packet number. You know, some of the devices, you know, in, an, in an enterprise setting, you cannot assume that everybody walking into the room will have the patch ready on their client side. So some of the AP vendors also provided a workaround for this. So the workaround on the AP side also is very simple. You know, if M3, you know, if the AP realizes that M4 did not come back, it doesn't just retransmit M3. It starts the process all over again, goes through M1 and M2. If I retransmit M1 and M2, if you go through this whole process again, the encryption key completely changes. That's how this protocol works. Okay. So that way, I'm making sure that two packets are not trans getting transmitted with the same encryption. Okay. But the penalty is, you know, it, let's say the network is very crowded, and sometimes genuinely M3 gets missed. Now, every time that happens, I have to go through M1 and M2 exchange again. So the connection establishment might take a little longer, but it makes sure that the network is protected. Okay. So that's the client-side vulnerability. And let's switch over and switch gears and talk about the AP side vulnerability. Now, the AP side vulnerability gets exposed during what we call as fast transition. Okay. You probably you know, had Wi-Fi connection, Wi-Fi link established, and you walked from the other end of the room to this end of the other end of the building to this end of the building. When that happens, your connection gets handed off from one AP to another. Okay. The typical process is every time the connection gets handed off from one AP to another, you have to go through this authentication process again and make sure that all the credentials are credentials and uh, security keys are established properly. Okay. But to make this process faster, Wi-Fi introduced a scheme called uh, Fast Transition where a similar vulnerability exists. Okay. In this fast transition process, there is this packet called reassociation request frame. You know, whenever this reassociation request frame is received, the client, the, the AP resets its packet number. That's the vulnerability that's getting exploited. Again, you know, we are tricking the AP into a device into resetting its packet number. The next slide basically goes into some more details on this. When this fast transition happens, you know, there's a couple of auth uh, authorization, uh, authentication exchanges, and then this reassociation request, reassociation response frame gets exchanged. Okay, the reassociation request comes from the client to the AP. So all that the device in the middle has to do is record this reassociation request frame. Okay, and then, uh, you know, it remembers that message. The client keeps sending messages, and at some point, I can just, all I have to do is just replay that re execution request message, okay? So that's a very special packet. It doesn't have any encryption. It doesn't have a packet number per se. So the AP will just pick up that packet, and once it receives it, it again resets the number. The malicious device recorded all the packets that came. It can start replaying it now because the, the, the a packet number got, has been reset with this reassociation request message. Okay. Uh, for this, you don't need anything sophisticated. All you need is a device that can record the messages and play back. You, know, you don't need any sophisticated man in the middle that has to do anything clever. Okay. Again, the fix for this is pretty straightforward. A quick workaround for this is disable this 11R because 11R is the one that is exposing this vulnerability. And most uh, Wi-Fi device, most Wi-Fi access points or routers have an option to disable 11R. Once you disable 11R, this vulnerability goes away. This is the quick workaround that was proposed initially. But the right thing to do is, you know, if the reassociation request comes, and I, the AP should not reset its packet number. Okay. Uh, so, so we basically talked about, you know, what is the loophole and how this loophole needs to be addressed with these fixes. Let me 
I have one slide that basically talks about the exposure, the real exposure. Okay. So to be able to execute this crack attack, you need a fairly sophisticated hardware and software, especially to expose the client-side vulnerability. You, know, you, you need a man in the middle that is simultaneously receiving packets from the client and playing it back to the AP. Okay. Uh, as you know, in most of these wireless devices are half duplex. They cannot transmit and receive at the same time. So you need some fairly sophisticated hardware that can simultaneously transmit and receive. They should not interfere with each other. They need sophisticated antennas. So a pretty complex hardware is needed to execute, especially the client-side attack. Okay. And then the other thing is, this is not an attack that somebody that is sitting in another continent can execute. You know, they can execute, but they need to make sure that this malicious device is sitting within the building. So somebody has to take this device, put it inside the building, otherwise this attack cannot be executed. Okay. And uh, you know, uh, some of these articles, the, the mainstream media articles, try to project as if there is an app that you can download and start executing this attack. That's not true at all. You know, you, uh, again, this is a pretty complex uh, way. It, it, you need a sophisticated system, sophisticated software, hardware to execute this attack. Um, you know, most of these enterprise access points have this feature called wireless intrusion prevention and detection. Now basically, if there is a man in the middle, there are ways to detect the man in the middle and then make sure that no client connects to the man in the middle. Okay. So if that is the case, if that logic existed, th th there is one more uh, you know, hurdle to executing this attack. Then, you know, even if you manage to execute the attack, you cannot inject or forge a packet. All you can do is decrypt or replay packets. Okay. Uh, and then there is no way to get to the encryption key or the password. Um, and then, the, the, you know, for all this to happen, so like I said, this epoll exchange is the phase during which this vulnerability gets exposed. And this epoll exchange happens once in a session. You know, there is this narrow window during which this packets get exposed and that's where the vulnerability happens. So you have to be monitoring all these, a malicious device has to be you know, cap, able to capture the packets right at that moment to execute this attack. Same thing with fast roaming as well. It doesn't happen forever, you know, only when somebody goes from one AP to another, that's when uh, you know, this particular phase happens. Okay. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, Yes, it is a vulnerability, and everybody needs to fix it, but it's not as bad as what some of the mainstream media projected. Okay. Um, here's my final slide. Uh, you know, as I said, it's all about tricking the AP or the client into resetting the packet number, and this happens when the key reinstallation happens, hence the name key reinstallation attack or crack. And by this time, as I said, it has been four months, most of the vendors have released patches to, to address this loophole. Uh, most of you might have already installed all those patches. And Wi-Fi Alliance, which is the industry consortium that is uh, taking care of this Wi-Fi, um, you know, they have, in, uh, they have added additional tests to WPA2 certification to make sure that this vulnerability doesn't exist in the software implementation. Okay. And also, recently, WPA3 got launched by WFA. So this is making uh, some of the security requirements tighter, and that hopefully will, not, uh, will make sure that such vulnerabilities do not happen in the future. That's all I have. Any questions or comments on this? All right, hopefully I was very clear then. <laughs> Sounds very clear. All right. All right, let's thank the doctor again, Dr. Sankari. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it.